Brahe found, through careful observations, was that there were certain things like comets and supernovae that clearly were taking place beyond the orbit of the moon. How did he know this? By what's called parallax. Parallax is the distance an object far away seems to move as a result of changing the position of the observer. So if you move from A to B on Earth and observe things that are going on far away, they see, for example, the moon it has, has a large parallax because it's not that far away. The, the, the principle is that the closer an object is, the larger the parallax, the larger the distance it seems to move when you move yourself as the observer. But the farther away something is, the less it will move. And so what he found was that the parallax that measured the movements of supernovae and comets in particular was very, very small, which indicated to him that changes are taking place in what Plato had taught was the realm of changeless perfection. And what Aristotle had referred to as the quintessential domain. Aristotle also thought that nature was composed of four elements, earth, air, fire, and water. But beyond the moon, there's something special, a fifth essence, something quintessential. And that means qualitatively different from what goes on here. Something, therefore, that can lift our hearts up from our immersion in purely earthly existence, perishing and becoming. But now, Brahe was showing that Aristotle's quintessential domain was being violated by these novelties. It's all in pieces. All coherence gone. So nature, or at least the heavens, are no longer that perfectly sacramental window onto perfection that had been able to lift up the hearts of so many people, including popes, kings, and common people for, for many, many ages including poets like John Donne. Another demotion, I'm just skipping over a lot of stuff here, but another demotion took place in 1605 as a result of Johannes Kepler's measurements of planetary movement. He discovered that the pathways and the orbits of planets take place not in the perfectly elegant circular way that we have thought, but in the rather ungainly form of ellipses. So another great loss. The heavens are losing their quintessential perfectional, uh, perfect, perfect character. But the final blow, you might say, was struck by Galileo himself by the power of his newly revised telescope. He, he found a toy-like telescope from northern Europe, and he took it and refined it and reshaped it into an instrument that could measure objects to the power of 20, which was amazing at that time. And as a result of his measurements, he discovered that the moon, which had previously been thought to be perfectly circular, perfectly global, is pocked with craters. It's not perfect at all. That beyond the moon, the planet Jupiter was being circled by stars, or he called them the planets themselves, wanderers that were not directly orbiting the Earth, but another heavenly body. And he discovered that Venus has phases, Saturn has ears, but above all, that most excellent of all heavenly bodies, the Sun, he discovered through careful measurements, reversing the telescope, and reflecting stuff on a white sheet, the Sun was blemished with what today we call sunspots. And from there on up to our own time, what astronomers and other scientists refer to as the principle of mediocrity began to spread over all of the universe so that everything became average, not just in Lake Wolverdon. <laughs> everything became average. Um, the Earth, we now realize, is an average planet circling an average star 
in an average galaxy in a universe composed of 200 billion galaxies or more. And now scientists are speculating that our 200 billion year galaxy observable universe is perhaps only one of many uh, universes. So the principle of mediocrity caught on in modern times. And as a result of that, we've had, I can't go into it tonight, we've had the idea uh, in modern times taking hold that we humans are not very important either, uh, especially when you measure us against the scale of time and space. We could talk about that. Teilhard de Chardin has a very interesting response to that, which we can't go into tonight. But anyway, the point is, increasingly in modern times, the heavens are no longer special. And they're no longer special because they're moving. They're becoming. And if they're becoming, that means they're not yet perfect. And if they're not yet perfect, they're imperfect. And that's the world we live in. And it seems like there's nothing in the universe, nothing, uh, that is not imperfect. So it raises the, the question for spirituality. Where then can we look for sacraments or signs or images or pictures of perfection that can allow us to lift up our hearts? And in many ways, I think that's one of the main side issues in the whole science and religion uh, discussion. Where do we turn for spirituality that can really grab hold of us and lift us up? Oh, I didn't believe Galileo, so I went to Pisa myself. <laughs> I went up in the tower and tried to, I dropped the little lead ball on the big one, and it's just as I was doing it, the tower started leaning. So I had to go down and not try to Anyway, what I'm leading up to is this, as a kind of transition. Galileo was a great writer. And his prose, some people say, it helped shape the modern Italian uh, Romance language. Well, here's some examples of his writing, just a few. Uh, he's asking in these quotes, what's so great about changelessness? In other words, he's talking to these big stars. Plato, who's been there for centuries as the philosopher, and Aristotle also, uh, and saying, what are you guys talking about? What's wrong with changelessness? And furthermore, what's so bad about change? I cannot without great wonder hear it being attributed to natural bodies as a great honor and perfection that they are impassable, immutable, inalterable. It is my opinion, he says, that the earth is very noble and admirable by reason of the many and different alterations, mutations, and generations which incessantly occur in it. He's doing a 180-degree pivot as to what can be valued. Not changelessness, but change. What greater fault can be imagined than to call gems, silver, and gold noble, because they had this durability about them, and earth, by which he means dirt, base, if there were as great a scarcity of earth, or dirt, as there is of jewels and precious metals, there would be no king who would not gladly give a heap of diamonds and rubies and many ingots of gold to purchase only so much dirt, earth, as would suffice to plant a jessamine, a jasmine plant, in a little pot or to set a tangerine in it, that he might see it sprout, grow up, and bring forth goodly leaves, fragrant flowers, and delicate fruit. Vitality could be alive at all has to undergo change. So what's, what's the problem? Here I think we have already, uh, you might say, early modern hints of what we might call a process worldview, which Alfred North Whitehead is going to be the Plato of as we'll see in a little bit. Alfred North Whitehead was born in 1861, died in the United States in 1857. I mentioned last week that he, he was the son of an Anglican pastor, but he himself, uh, later on in life, became an agnostic and perhaps even an atheist. 
for a while. But his son died in battle in World War I. And this had a deep effect on him, I think. Because ever since then, he got really personally as a philosopher interested in the question of perishing and how to make sense of perishing. I mean, even 